Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're going to take a first look at Blade and Bow, The Ancient World at War from War Diary Publications and designed by the esteemed Mike Nagel. This game covers four battles between the Greeks and Persians starting in 479 BCE and running to 490 BCE. This game has card-driven mechanics, intricate and detailed combat and movement, morale, command and control. In many ways, my initial reactions are commands and colors, ancients on steroids. Let's jump in and take a look at the components and offer some initial impressions on gameplay. Before we start in and look at the components, let's set a little bit of context around this. There are rule references in here to this being the first volume in a series of quad games exploring ancient World of War combat. And while this game has Greek versus Persian scenarios, and we'll talk about those momentarily, there are rule references, for example, to Roman units, and there are rule references to some types of um, counters that aren't present in this rule set. So this clearly has a, a design vision of being the first volume in a number of volumes exploring the ancient world at war using this combat system. And uh, to kind of talk specifically about the scenarios that we get in this game, we have Mycali in 479 BCE, we get Plataea 479 BCE, we get the Battle of Thermopylae 480 BCE, and then lastly the Battle of Marathon in 490 BCE. And let's take a look now at the backside here just to kind of get some general context for the game. There isn't much information here in terms of solitaire suitability. I will talk about that as we go through the rules. I have a couple of observations on that. Um, complexity is listed as moderate. I think that's fairly accurate. I would give this a complexity out of a 4 of 10. And one of the things I think is working in its favor, and I'll talk about that as we look at the rules more in depth, is there. I think there's a very high level of clarity to this rule set. There are some unique elements in the combat, I think, is, is detailed and gritty in a very good way. But the rule set seems very clear. I really like how that's written. We'll talk about that more as we look at it. So I think, though, however, the complex complexity of moderate, I'm going to go a 4 out of 10 on this one. Uh, there is some meat to it, and there is some heft to it, but it seems like a really good playable system. Now, the other thing, it doesn't mention game length here. I would guess an hour to two hours of the four, the four games slash scenarios that are in here. Uh, there is a variable end length. They can go six to 12 turns, uh, depending upon some route factors and things like that. So I think, you know, a game that tends toward that higher turn count is probably going to be closer. I would guess about two hours. Uh, you know, one of the shorter ones, probably about an hour. I might be a little bit short on that, but that feels about right. Certainly, I think one of the appeals of this system, giving the size, the counter size of the games and the scenarios and the game length and the complexity, you know, this looks like a very much a great system for a two player single sitting. You know, I, I would think you could easily play a game and a scenario in an evening. You know, the longest it's probably going to go is two and a half, three hours. So I think definitely this is a kind of game you can get together with somebody else and play in a single setting. All right, let's take a look at what is inside. First up, there on the very top, we have our dice. Now, there are four dice that come with the game. However, um, it is a dice-dependent combat system, and you can be using as many as 16 dice in an individual combat. So you'd either want to kind of re-roll some of these or add your own dice into the system. Um, I would think it's probably going to be a good idea to add your own because you're going to be want to tracking some of the rules to tabulate the results. And, and with that in mind, this is a very dice-dependent combat system. So uh, you, instead of having die roll modifiers, you're often going to be adding dice to the combat, looking to kind of positive results for you on a one or a two or a five or a six. There are some reroll options, but some of these combat, the dice roll mod, the dice roll additions would be depending upon what your rank, how many ranks of uh, uh, units you have, how many ranks of forces you have in the combat, uh, the angle of attack and leadership and things like that will be modifying how many dice you get to use in combat. Now, there's also a deck of cards. We'll come back to that momentarily. Let's start, however, with our 24 page rule book. Um, there is some informational here, in, in, there information here on other War Diary games, as well as their outstanding uh, high quality magazine that's worth looking at if you like wargaming magazine content as well. Now, 24 pages again, the back page is promotional material. We get some designer notes on the back page here, some scenario, uh, historical context behind all the four scenarios here that stretch back to page 18. So really we're looking at 17 pages of rules with the rules starting kind of on page one. Now, a couple of general comments about the rules. They're very traditional layout. Um, we have a, a moderate amount of graphics, although they are text heavy. A very nice movement example here that I think is very helpful for talking through the rules. 
I've made a pass through the rules. Uh, my general impression of the rules are that the, the clarity behind the rule writing is excellent, really, really good. As I'm reading individual paragraphs and looking through things, it's very, very clear what's going on. Um, I've only got kind of one lingering question on the re-roll of dice, but I think that's just because I haven't quite sorted out a section here. But my initial impressions of the rule sets are the rule set. It's it's quite good in terms of right not quite good. It's very good in terms of writing and clarity of writing. I think this is going to be a very playable system. All of the uniqueness of movement and the uniqueness of combat seem to be very clearly explained. Now, caveat, I, you don't know for sure until you start to play, but my initial impressions of this rule set are very, very good. And just as kind of walking through some of the mechanics that we have in here, some of the bigger ones, leaders play a very significant role on what happens. Movement is very kind of uh, detail and intricate, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we look at some of the square maps and some of the rectangular counters. Looks like a really cool system that gives you um, eight different coordinate kind of directional points for units and things. Uh, there's ranged combat, of course, for your bows. We get melee combat, which has a really neat influence of morale. Now, morale isn't mentioned here in the top part because morale kind of weaves its way through all of the elements. You know, you need kind of sometimes a morale check to get involved in melee combat. There's a routing system, a rally system that involves with things like disruption. You have a camp that's going to kind of kind of help with rallies and leadership and things like that. Uh, and then some unique things here, which shield walls, a type of defense. But it really seems like the research behind making this combat system reflect the combat and tactics of this time um, has been quite good. So it, it, it's looks, it, it feels like ancient combat. It's got a really good feel to it. And I think the rule set articulates that well. Let's take a look now at our cards. There's about 60 cards in the game here and they play um, three different functions within the game. So you can add them either as uh, the top part here, which is a melee commitment, using them in a particular, and you're gonna, each side's gonna have a hand that they're gonna be playing and drawing and things like that and playing them. But there are basically three components to them. There's a melee commitment on the top here, there's an event part in the middle, and then there's this is a part that you draw at the beginning of a different phase where it's gonna indicate how many command actions you have depending upon the quality of your leader. There are four different uh, colors that leaders can be distinguished by. So you're gonna have an impulse-based turn system that's going to depend on the quality of your leader as to whether you're going to get as many or more or fewer impulses than your opponent. You can use these cards as kind of enhancing individual combat, melee combat situations, or you can be playing them as your events. So a lot of fun, really neat systems here for looking at these events. The events, I've looked through these, these look really cool. Looks like there's a lot of different ways to play these. And this, I think, is point number one that I would like to make in the solitaire kind of evaluation of the game. You know, there, there is some element here when you talk about bolt players having cards uh, if you're playing that solitaire you lose a little bit of that hidden nature between behind what you know what cards do my what does my opponent have and so that's thing I don't think it's a major influence on solitaire play but it is something that kind of is different in a two-player version when you don't know what cards your opponent have or what your, your you know what your opponent is thinking about with cards that's going to impact that solitaire play there but a lot of fun looks like a really good kind of a uh, kind of very creative and very uh, appropriate set of events for this time and period. Looks like it's going to be a really fun system and I like kind of the variety of ways uh, between the melee commitment or the event that you can be using the cards in particular situations. Let's take a look at my favorite component, favorite parts of the game here now, the components, the, the counters here. There are two counter sheets. Let me get them out here. Um, I think we can actually go through this one first. Uh, these are the units. The second one is, is actually almost exclusively markers. These are our units. We get blue and red, one for the Persians, one for the Greeks. And again, I think that coloring system is probably got a vision towards the future. There isn't anything that distinguishes these units by nation. So these I think would be counters you could probably use in subsequent sets or making up your own scenarios and things. We have basically three different types of units on this page. We have the camps, one for each side, which is kind of your headquarters if you would. Then we have the various combat units and then these smaller square counters are the leaders. Now these are all laser cut. You can actually see some of the, the, cut, the burns from the laser that's gone through here off to the sides of the counters. Very light, I think a kind of a low gloss matte finish to them. They look really good, very legible and things like that. We've got, just in terms of looking at some of the units, we've got light cavalry bows. There's a ranged component to it. Uh, Peltast immortals are in here. Hoplites are in here. So a lot of different kinds of units that represent the different types of formations that were in this period. Now, let's take a look at our second component here, which is the whole counter set that adds 
a very unique dimension to, I think, this combat system. So what we're looking at here are ranks. And basically what that means is, this is another element that I think impacts the solitaire play a little bit. Um, the unit by itself, if you see just one, the counter by itself, oh, also too, it's worth mentioning, there is a disruption side, right, to the other side here. So units can be disrupted in combat and you would be flipping them over and they can get disrupted in a number of ways, through combat results or through movement and things like that. Um, you're leaving enemy zones of controls and stuff like that can impact that there. But by itself, the default here is kind of a generic one rank, but you can be adding ranks to your units and you put these rank counters underneath the counter itself and there are limited times as to when your opponent can examine your units they have to be either like in an enemy zone of con in zone of control when you can see them or viewing them from the side so there is a certain kind of fog of war element and in each scenario you've got some flexibility as to where and how you apply ranks to units during your setup so for example you may have you know, six hoplites that on average could be two ranks de deep, but you could shift some of them to being one rank deep and others of them, and here we can see these are the zero ones on the back, meaning no modification. So you're gonna be using those to disguise your opponent and some of them to be maybe two or three. And that is an element that I think you know, is impacts the solitaire play. Because if you're playing that two player, you've got a lot of ability maybe to overload one side of your form formation or, you know, empower the middle of your formation with a chance to punch through the enemy and cut them in half. And that's something that when you're playing at solitaire, you're obviously going to know how you set up each side and what you're thinking about it. Again, I don't think that's a game breaker for solitaire. I think because of that in the card deck, I would say this kind of levels out about a five out of 10 as a solitaire experience with the two factors that are influencing that, the, that you will lose that hiddenness and that fog of war that's evident when you're putting these kind of rank counters underneath your combat units to distinguish the actual depth and strength of that unit. And then, you know, the fact that you're going to know what your opponent or, or cards each side has as you're playing two player. And there is no bot or any kind of system within that. But yes, for the most part, these are ranks. We do have a few more combat units down here. And then we have melee markers. So melee, for example, uh, you might have to go through a morale check so it's not evident even though you want to attack an enemy unit whether that unit's actually going to kind of uh, you kind of put that action put that command into action so there is a kind of a morale check for engaging in melee the combat system in general i think it feels very kind of intricate and detailed yet very playable i think that's one of the things that got me the most excited about this is kind of the way movement and combat and leadership all seem to play together. I mentioned in the beginning a reference towards uh, commands, uh, commands and Colors Ancients. This feels like the, a lot of the elements are the same. I mean, it's ancient combat, so it makes sense, right? There's going to be some similarity. There's no surprise there. But this has got a lot more depth and subtlety to the combat system, which gets me really excited. This is going to be a really fun game to play. Let's take a look at our player aids. These are, there are three of them. Uh, pretty straightforward. This is kind of your turn. These are uh, very kind of thin cardboard, thicker paper. This is your uh, tracking chart. So uh, a lot of the victory conditions are based on your ability to withstand losses and that when you reach a certain amount of losses, you know, you what you're tracking here, then you're gonna hit your route condition, which means that the battle's over and you concede the battle to your opponent. So a lot of what you're trying to do in combat is to, to inflict more casualties on your opponents than you suffer. And there is a whole rally and routing system that's influenced on leaders. You can kill leaders. A lot of things can happen there to kind of weaken the effectiveness of your enemy side. And then, as we mentioned, we have a turn track scenarios. I think by and large can go six to 12 turns and you're kind of evaluating at turn six as to whether you're driving on to turn 12. So there's some, some variation that goes on there. This is single-sided, of course, because you're gonna be keeping this up beside the maps to be able to look at that while you're playing. Here are your scenario uh, characteristics. We've talked about those before, giving the setup conditions and any special rules that might apply to the scenario. Again, I'm really excited to kind of try Thermopylae and then the marathon battles. Those, of course, probably the, the two most well-known here, but Plataea and Mycali, of course, very interesting combat situations as well. And then lastly, a one page uh, combat reference. Uh, it's on two sides. So we've got the terrain effects chart here on one side that talks about different uh, movement effects, range combat effects. There is a line of sight, a very basic line of sight system here. Again, it looks pretty easy to enact. I think all of the rules in here, my general sense is this is a very well thought out, 
detailed combat system and yet playable at the same time. I really feel like it's not going to play fiddly, it's going to play smooth, it looks like it's going to be really fun. It's the kind of game you say as you're reading the rules you go, oh that's cool, I get it. I think that's going to work really well. And then melee combat effects over here is how it terrain impacts that. Then we get a very detailed sequence of play. There is again some depth and detail to this as we look at that. Melee combat processes, for example, roll attack dice. You know, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, eight different modifiers that are going to be going through that. So until you get used to this, I mean, a lot of them are very, very simple, like three here, light, medium, or heavy are going to be one die, two die, or three die, you are, plus your additional ranks. You're going to know that right away, right? That's super easy. Easy. There's just a few in here that you're checking. So even though there are eight and it's all articulated here, I feel like, oh, that's got a cool depth to it, and yet it's going to be pretty easy to apply. Talking about units, talking about the unit facing and elements down in here, but it looks again just really well thought out, really supportive. I think this is going to be, this in particular, looks like a very handy reference to have. Now, lastly, let's take a look at our maps. We have four of them, one each single-sided, one for each of the four games slash scenarios of them. Each one of these is 17 by 22. I will show an overview of these as I pull them out. Um, I think these are, as we look at these, these are very functional. One of the things I really like about them is that for each battle, this one here is the Battle of Marathon that we're looking at, the 490 BCE one. You know, the terrain is very subtle. I think the units are going to stand out here. Uh, these are a thicker paper, kind of a card stock, a uh, very matte finish, which I like as someone who makes videos of games because there's not really any glare involved with them. And again, we are looking at squares here, but let me just show you real quick how facing works with units. So just to give a little highlight on how this works with units, I've put up two hoplite units here. Now units can face in a particular square, they can face in any one of eight different directions. They can face to either of the sides, but they can also face diagonally off to one of these corners. And what's really neat about this is how zone of control works. So zone of control with these units, basically if you've got a unit that's tilted to the side here like this, these are your front zones of controls, these are your flanks, and these are, these are your rear elements here. Now you exert a zone of control to the front, but you exert a strong zone of control directly in front of you and a weak zone of control to the sides. However, one of the other things that comes into play here is if two adjacent units share a common weak zone of control, it becomes a strong zone of control, which is cool, right? For this side, this angular movement, this kind of diagonal placing within it, because technically, if we look at these two units here, by definition, the square immediately in front is a strong zone of control. This is a strong zone of control. This would be a weak zone of control, which from a combat perspective is a little bit goofy, but we have two units sharing adjacent and sharing a weak zone of control, so this becomes a strong zone of control. So it's a really cool system, I think, for kind of building up a lot of nuance to these diagonal and formation-based units in ancient combat. It looks really cool. And also what I like too is both for range and command and movement, it uses a similar cost system in terms of distance. Now, because of the way it's structured, a simple um, orthogonal move here is two movement points and a diagonal move is three movement points. And that distance works the same way for firing range and it works the same way for command and control. So once you learn those basics, it can be applied to all different situations in terms of um, ca ca calculating distance for various functions during the game. And there are costs to kind of rotate and depending on whether you're a heavy, a meat or meteor or a light unit, there's all kinds of elements that come into play too. But it seems like, again, a very thoughtful, elegant system to reflect the combat command and movement of the time. I'm super excited to see how this plays out. But again, to get back now to our map conversation, you know, these are very subdued, very moderate, very kind of, I think, um, low key kind of chill maps. There's nothing stunning visually to them. They seem very functional that I think they're gonna let the units and the counters stand out and kind of make it easy to move them. One thing that I really like, um, you can see here just very lightly all of the starting positions for setup, which is gonna make setup for the battles very, very easy. Here we have the blue and here we have the red forces for this one, Battle of Marathon, we've got hills over here. We've got some woods and a kind of a road through there with some swamp up there and then a river off here to the, the far side of it. But yeah, very simple, basic, functional, playable maps. Let's take a look at Maikali here, which is the second one. So if we look at this one here, again, similar style, similar art style. We can see the starting positions here, kind of some of the terrain. We've got woods and things and we've got the hills playing a role here off on this side of the battlefield. So a quick look at that one. 
Here is Thermopylae, which I'm really interested to see how this one plays out. We have here too the Goat Path, which has a number of scenario rules for it. Of course, you know, what the Persians uh, historically used to get behind the Spartan position. And then I think the pass area that the Spartans are defending is over here. And so you're going to have a mass of Persians again trying to break their way through the, the Spartan formation. Here we have the start, starting positions for the Spartans here and then a ton of Persians up here. So I'm very curious to see how this one plays out. There's some a lot of unique rules, I think, that look to try to make this a very playable scenario for both sides and a fun scenario for both sides. So that one looks cool. And of course, most of these hills here, I think if not all of them are impassable for the Spartans except or the Persians except for that goat path element in there. Lastly, the Battle of Plataea. We have again on a rather open plain with some, some creeks and rivers here that are cutting through there, opening formation. This looks like one of the larger ones just based upon the starting units. I mean, there are a lot of units here in two different, almost three different formations for the red and two for the blue. So looks like one of the larger scenarios here. So I imagine there is some variety in, term, in depth in terms of you know how long and how the scope and size of each scenario, but all of them certainly look very playable, I think, in a single sitting again. And that brings us to the end. Blade and Bow from War Diary Publications, designed by Mike Nagel, an exploration and perhaps the first volume in a series of quad games exploring the ancient world at war with a unique combat and movement square and rectangular unit based system. Be happy to answer any questions that you might have and thank you so much for watching. I very much look forward to getting this one to the table.